generation becomes more and more um, feasible, energy storage becomes more part of the solution, you'll be able to generate and create on your own property. You won't need a utility. You like the bell? So he that's it. He gets more bells? Like eight, bells. Eight, six bells. Six bells. So eight is six four. six bells in the Navy? He does, not everybody. Um, because of the I think stripes? it's pretty cool. I actually got to see the really? tour of the, the plant in November. Um, it's all automated. All automated. Oh, I didn't do it right. I, ding, I got ding, to six. Here, I can be inside boy, Okay. Arrived. The Admiral. No, not anymore. <laughs> All right. Have a seat for just a second. Sure. <laughs> Didn't realize that the Admiral got six bells. I've, I've not been in the Navy. My name's Peter Meissen. Thank you for being here. Many of you I, uh, I know already, and some I know are here for the very first time. So, so welcome. Uh, Hello, I'm the director Alistair. here at the World Resources Simulation Center, and if you haven't been here before, usually people go, what is this place? You know, what do you do here? And, and uh, the short version of it, we visualize sustainable solutions. That's our mission, is to visualize sustainable solutions to both global and local problems. This is a perfect discussion tonight for that, so we make more informed choices quicker. So that's our mission here at the, at the Sim Center, based on some work of a man named Buckminster Fuller that said we needed, we needed a place, we needed a venue where we could surround ourselves in the issues of the day and understand the past trends. How did we get to where we are today? The future projections, because that's really what a lot of us are interested in, is where are we headed, so that we, again, make more smart, sustainable choices quicker. So uh, we're a perfect venue here for tonight. I am very honored to have uh, Admiral Len Herring uh, uh, tonight on, on the subject, subject of, of climate change and why we, need, why we need to change. I have seen this presentation a few months ago, and it is clear, um, abundantly clear, <laughs> that what we're doing is not sustainable and we need to shift course. So that's, uh, uh, that's what I believe you'll hear this evening. Um, uh, the Admiral is now retired out of the Navy. He was our Navy Admiral here in San Diego, kind of our Navy Mayor for, I don't remember exactly how many years, but ran the, ran the fleet for the Pacific out of, the, out of San Diego here, retired. He's now the director at the Center for Sustainable Energy, which manages all of the funded programs to get solar on your rooftop here in California and other states. Now they've branched into other states. So one of the, um, really one of the important uh, organizations in our region that's doing the work of rooftop solar. He'll tell you probably about his own rooftop. He was just sharing that, that his bill was this much this last month. So it is a, um, it is a, it is a working solution. Pocket change. Um, he's involved in many <coughs> other uh, uh, institutions here as board members, a board member and an advocate. So I'm going to, if he wants to share those, I just, you know, you, you have an impressive gentleman here to t tell this story tonight. And uh, um, I guess the one other thing I'd like to share is uh, the Sim Center is partnering with the San Diego Renewable Energy Society. It's another nonprofit organization here in San Diego to tackle the issue called, how do we be a 100% renewable city? Uh, we had Todd Gloria come in about two, three months ago. He put that stake in the, sta in the sand that says, we can be a 100% renewable city by 2035. That is doable. Other cities have done it. It's on, on the website here on how they've done it. Uh, we would like for you to be involved in that and join that. We have a whole year-long program with the Renewable Energy Society, and this is one of those important discussions tonight on that path. So uh, that's something you can be involved in, and we'd love to have you actually sign if you're involved this little pledge button right there that says you as an individual would like to be part of that commitment to make 100% renewable city for our city, for our county, and then there's a whole lot of things on the take action that, that you can do as a renter, as a homeowner, as a business owner, um, there already. So uh, that's a little bit of uh, homework or involvement. If you'd like to be in involved more deeply, you can be more involved more deeply with us. Uh, some of you are members already. I want to thank you for your membership because uh, we actually invite you to come in and not pay for this. For those of you that aren't members, we'd like to invite you to consider that. Uh, if you think that this is valuable this evening, I think you'll find that to be so. Uh, it's easy to be a member. There's a white card in front of you here or online. 
you can join as a member, and then you get to come for free. So we'd love to have you and, and join us and be a member of our, of our work here all year long. Uh, I believe that's it. So uh, before you jump up, I'm going to need your help with the 12 computers that we have. So if you have, if you're sitting at one of these 12 computers, there is a button at the bottom that says PowerPoint. Would you click on that now for all of you? Ranger Brom, are you going to you still with us here, Brom? Yes. Click on that PowerPoint button. And you're sitting at a laptop. And so up in the upper left-hand corner, it says from the current slide, if you all will kick, click from the current slide, hopefully I think you're on, these are already pre-numbered, four, five, six. Same thing with you, Mark. Click right, that button right there. You're there. Seven, eight, nine. Did we lose nine? Paul Michael? Or Stinky. Nine. It's a heavy one. Uh, ten. So Norm, at the bottom right here, click that little red button right down there, Norm. Good. And then we're going to want to go from the current slide, 11, 12. Some of these are going to be small on our screen, like this one's going to be small, just the size of it, but you can, yeah. you can still speak to that. Oh, right? absolutely. It's, okay. it's a headline. So it's important. So from the current slide, and Brom on yours up here, would you just, I think if you click on that little button, or where is it right down here, to make it full screen. I think it's that button right there. Right. You'll make it full screen. This one here? Nope. See where I'm pointing? Oh. This one right here. Click on that button. That one? And that'll make it full screen. We're full screen all the way around. So these are your first 12 slides. What we'd like to do is have, uh, have the Admiral kind of tell the story of this first 12. Some of them have reveals. For some of you know, you have a, a button that shows you how to do that reveal. And you'll click it. enter That's a couple of times. And then we'll have a good conversation after the first set of 12. There's four sets of 12 tonight. All right, so mm -hmm. we'll go through those four sets of 12. Uh, so with that, Admiral, thank you for being here. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for coming out and um, not listening to the other side. Hopefully, I'll be much more informative than anything you could get tonight on TV anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I say that, of course, tongue-in-cheek, um, because before we start, I just want to lay some groundwork. Um, I would like this to be um, a two-way so that we can have some conversation if we'd like to um, while we're going through this. But more importantly, I want you to understand that um, the information that I'm about to present for you, if you suffer from nightmares, um, you need to go home. Uh, because I'm gonna be blunt um, and I'm gonna be forthright um, with the information that I'm gonna share with you. Uh, because I think that the important part of our ability to be able to prepare ourselves for the future is that we collectively, not red, not blue, not America, but mankind needs to have a much more adult conversation about what it is that we're doing um, and how we are preparing the, uh, and setting the stage for potentially um, those who follow us. Um, and if you are um, of any sort um, older in the tooth, um, I provide for you a reason, my three reasons for being sustainable um, in slide number three, and that's my grandchildren, um, because I honestly do believe that if we are not more careful, that my grandchildren are not going to have the same opportunities that I have been, been afforded. So before we get started a little bit, I want to give you a little bit of my background first and foremost. Um, I joined the Navy um, to avoid the draft. Yes. Um, I was drafted at 17. Um, and uh, sought a, a deferment, um, couldn't, go th couldn't afford to send myself through college, so I got an ROTC scholarship, um, finished that ROTC scholarship from the State University of New York uh, at Maritime College, and decided I was going to just do my four and get out. Well, little did I know that it would be closer to four decades, not four years, um, but had a great opportunity, and I joined the Navy um, to see the world. Um, my dad had been in the Navy. Um, I decided to go into the Navy, and I wanted to see the world, and I did. 63 different countries, 154 different ports. So I've seen plenty of what I'm going to talk about today, and more importantly, hopefully bring a different perspective 
on a few of the things that most ugly Americans don't want to talk about. Um, and why it's so important that we have the conversation, because as we look forward, each of the areas that I point out come in direct conflict of who and what we are, collectively. So don't be offended by that. I love the country I defended, but I love the planet that God has given us more. And I take the responsibility as a grandparent to be more responsible about what I leave for my grandchildren and their children as we go forward. So I will also preface that by telling you that much of what I'm going to talk about tonight is all about the security of us as a nation. Because if we don't have this conversation, our security is at risk. And I'm going to show you why. So in order to get paid for this, you need to know who we are. Um, this is my, my speech for the Center for Sustainable Energy. I am the executive director, and our job is to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world powered by clean energy. We're agnostic. I don't care how you get there from here. The truth is, is that what we are doing is moving us, the world, away from the fossil-based energy demands that have now fueled us since about 1850, realistically, okay? And how do we get there from here? Recognizing that we need to maintain security. We need to continue to provide opportunities for our prosperities. We need economic growth. We need to be able to understand how they translate, and they all have to be part of the equation. You can't disregard any of them. But what you need to know, again, I will hit on a few points, is that things are changing drastically in the world. And they're changing not just from a geopolitical sense, but they're changing from a, um, on a climatic um, difference, huge differences. So let's go through some of these. Again, my three reasons. And the real question is just how sustainable are we? If you look at all of the functions and you recognize and you want to have that serious conversation, you have to ask the question, if we continue down the road making the decisions that we have made, and thank you very much, Grandma and Grandpa, for setting up the system that has allowed me to get here, but the truth is, is that if I continue to do what my grandparents set up for me, we are not sustainable. It's physically, it's resource constrained and impossible for us to consider that somehow we can just keep right on going and survive what's ahead of us. So it's not possible. So I want to put things in perspective. So this chart, oh, you hit the button already. But anyway. You can go back. Oh, I'm going to go back one. There's the first. To put things in perspective, we need to, be, we need to understand where we are and how we fit into this, this equation. So if you were to put the Earth on a 365-day scale, the beginning of Earth being day number one, January 1st, today being December 31st, the same year. How long has man been on the face of the earth? Read it. 14 seconds. A total of 14 seconds. So when people say we couldn't possibly have an effect, everything that you're seeing couldn't possibly be caused by man? Seriously, let's have a, a, a more adult conversation. And there are two charts that you need, two, two points on this chart that you need to understand. Push the button. First is, that represents 65 million years. 65 million years is significant in the time of life and the time of the Earth because that's kind of around the space where our continents, yeah, our continents were formed, our atmosphere as we know it began to form and the introduction of the more sophisticated land animal became part of the bigger equation. So 65 million years is important. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't care what happened before that. But yet many of the individuals who will tell you, don't worry about some of these conditions, those particular conditions existed prior to 65 million years. 
So who cares if during the Precambrian era, when dinosaurs roamed the face of the Earth, that it was 600 parts per million? The acidic levels of the, of the uh, um, atmosphere at that point in time would have taken the skin off your body. So I don't care that 600 or whatever it is, 24.4 million years ago, makes, or 20, 240 million years ago. It doesn't make any difference. 65 million years is the point that we want to talk about. Then the next one, give me the next one, is that one. And that's where Homo sapien appeared on the face of the Earth. Not us, Homo sapien. So remember, there's a huge period of walking on two to standing up to getting to, to us today, 14 seconds. That's the period we want to talk about. Next. You've heard it over and over and over again, the 360 degree view, honestly, no joke. Listen to it, doesn't make any difference. Where you go, you'll hear it. Oh my God, we've been there before. It'll take care of itself. The earth is much more resilient than that. Uh, okay, I got it. It's not about all this stuff that we're talking about. Hit it. Hit the slide. I think that's the next, next is up at number six now. Who's got six? Just hit. Nope, you, you're changing the slides. Anyway, the words all disappear. All I care about is there we go. the planet. That's all I care about. All the rest of the stuff is our excuses to figure out a different way to do business and to defend what we know today without having that adult conversation. My friend Sam Locklear, the commander of the Pacific Theater, is the first individual to testify in the Congress that climate change is the single greatest security risk to the United States and the free world, which sometimes is left out, short North Korea. But I would contend that having been the North Korea desk officer on the Joint Staff for two years and being the individual responsible for the war plan, we can take care of Korea in no time flat. I'm not so sure that the second order of business is going to be that easy. And all and experts agree. The next chart over. And I don't care whether it's from academia or from geopolitical experts, because the first one is done from an academic a Center for American, um, uh, what is it, progress, coupled with the Heinrich Institute in Germany. But they took a look at the conditions as the globe is changing and relatively um, made or, or did a relative analysis on what was happening and what potentially would happen if it continued based upon the forecasts, and every one of them came to the same conclusion. CNA, the Center for Naval Analysis, conducted a study using 13 theater commanders, four-star commanders of all four services, who came up with the same bottom line conclusions that if we're not more careful, if we don't understand that we need to plan for this stuff, there is a significant risk to national security on a global scale due to climate change. All 13 of them agreed. Both of these reports are downloadable, so again, I would suggest you read them. This is 32 pages, this one's 140, but it's a great read because it's a great academic piece. Now we want to take a look at, okay, so what are all the things that we need to talk about, and why are all of these different pieces important? The first thing I want to do, because this is what, this is what these guys took a look at and said, if we had to take a look at all of the different issues associated with and why this becomes a bigger deal, what are all of the compounding elements that we are facing in the globe that need to be understood by everyone because it's all part of the conversation? If you want to have an adult conversation, for we scientists, you throw all the variables on the table, all of the variables on the table, include those variables that make making the equation solve difficult. And that's what we are doing here because these are things we don't want to talk about collectively. And the first thing I'm going to point to is mankind and nature. Give me the first slide. 
The fact is, is that the rainforests across the globe are vanishing at a tremendous rate. What's worse is, is that due to climate change, there are major portions of rainforests and forests, the very sequestration that we're looking for to solve climate change, is occurring at the same rate. As a matter of fact, the forests of Africa are dying at a rate two times that of the Brazilian rainforest. Not because of people, but because they haven't had rain in 12 years. The forests are literally dying. And the more the forests die, the more difficult it becomes to sequester the very carbon that we're talking about in this whole process. The rainforests on their, on their own and the forests in general, both from the need for us to populate as well as to do other things to maintain ourselves, is getting to a condition, next slide, that is having a massive Uh, a, 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 a massive um, effect on those animals that live in those forests. More animals have gone extinct in my lifetime than the previous 1,800 years. Imagine that. Every day, 10 species are added to the endangered list. So what does a zoo look like in my grandchildren's life? In their, grand, in their children's life? Does it look more like the National History Museum in New York, where what's left of those individuals are behind glass somewhere? Because the truth is, we're not being very protective of what this means. And we're having a drastic effect on what the total population is. And I'm not saying we can't figure out, but you know what? He gave us dominion. I don't believe that dominion included its eradication. That's a, that's a different process, a different conversation as we have it. Okay, so let's go to the next step, which is just as important, number 10. Our ocean's health, where life itself evolved. It is the one thing that makes us different from all the other planets in our universe, our oceans. First hit. We were going one too many, but that's okay. That picture that just showed up is the exact same reef 10 years apart. Those are the exact same photos of the exact same locations of the critical reefs in our Gulf Coast states 10 years later. This is what's happening because of the acidification of the coastal waters due to both carbon, fertilization, and pollution. This equates to virtually zero biodiversity. Next, and the next part was, and recognize please my degree, no, go back to, go back to. On the left, push the left arrow, Norm. Yeah, okay. Now, now hit enter. I have a degree, um, I have a degree in meteorology and oceanography. Um, so I understand the fluids um, in both of, the, both of these cases, um, but I've also taken enough courses to know that um, the environment that is the ocean, from a biological perspective, the creatures that live in the ocean are eight times more sensitive to our environment than to those animals that crawled out of it. So we're not as, we're not as sensitive to things like pressure, oxygen differences, pH, um, salinity, just the typical stuff. We are much more tolerant of our environment than marine life. As a matter of fact, if you understand how things are happening in the globe, and I'm going to point out a couple of them today, the very fact that they are disappearing will in fact create larger problems in the very near future. So the first of that is the global loss of seafood. There are only 3% of the adult fish population left in the oceans compared to 50 years ago, 3%. We have fished 97% of the adult population of our world's oceans in 40, in 50 years. And worse, if you extrapolate, 
by 2050, we're in a world of hurts. And it's not so much that it's not the, the fish population. The problem is, is it's the adult fish population. Okay, so it's not the, just the fish population. Next slide. And this is the state of our oceans. 85% of the, that food source is basically fished out. 35% of the mangroves, which is where the biodiversity actually occurs. So within the, the um, straits surrounding the equator, mangroves exist. The Philippine Islands, for example, are about 60% mangroves. The biodiversity of the ocean subsists primarily from the mangroves. It's how the Caribbean states, um, Florida, all of the biodiversity along our coastlines, 35% of the mangroves in the world have been destroyed. 20% of the coral reefs. And again, the coral reefs are biodiversity. They are the coastal, they are the coastal diversity that provides us the opportunity for those ecosystems to exist. And then worse, 250,000 square miles of dead zone. These are areas within our oceans that no longer house biodiversity. So they've gotten to such a point where there isn't any life. And there are three, three of these areas just off the coast of California. So if you've not seen what's going on there. Next one. And here's the real scare point. 70% of the world's population gets its protein from the sea. 70%. Keep that figure in mind because we're going to go to the next one. And the next two are going to reveal some other um, important issues. One, if people think this is not an issue that's causing concern from a security perspective, you need to go to the BBC or read information that comes out of the UN or some others. I hate to say this, but despite the fact that we consider or think that we have an open press, um, they're open to whatever they want to talk about, not necessarily the relevant facts um, around the globe. But the fact is, is for any of us who have been involved in maritime operations, we know that the South China Sea has been contentious for years. But more importantly, in the last five years, China has got involved. China has got involved in the idea of territorial claim of the South China Sea, not because they care whether those four islands become part of China, but because the fishing of the South China Sea has become a relevant issue because of the biodiversity that has been eradicated along the coastlines and now only support the fishing population in the South China Sea. The biodiversity has been created, the biodiversity has basically been decimated in the northern portion of the, of the China Sea and is now pushing massive populations of fish which again, 70% of the world's population, Chinese and Asians in particular, subsists from the ocean. In this particular area, this is in the Indian Ocean. This is Sri Lanka and India. These Sri Lankan fishermen were told that if they were ever caught in the area again, they would never return home. The biodiversity along both of their coastlines are in severe crisis. Countries will go to war over food. And when 70% of, the of, the, of their population subsists from that food, you can bet your bottom dollar they will have no problem going to war for it. John? Right. So 50% 50 of the seafood consumed today is farmed. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty good figure here in the States, not so much elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> well, correct. Correct. About 80% is what's fish, that's correct. But what we also have to recognize is that 
In the same fashion, and this is from the USDA report, in the same fashion, those farmed fish are not being fed naturally. Okay? Um, and it is, a, it is in itself a concern because just like you feed everything else, how much of the other stuff are we introducing into the meat that we're now consuming? So uh, when I just uh, 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 yeah, if you got a comment you, for for your question to be heard by people who are listening and later on, you have to speak into one of these microphones. It's not going to amplify it. It's, it's not going to sound like it's being heard, but we'll hear it on the tape. So if you have a question, you got to speak into one of the mics. Okay. Okay. So so like eighty percent of that farm fish is being farmed in those northern rivers. Correct. And I'm going to show you a few pictures of why it should be a bigger concern. Okay. We have another, so this is good Q&A time. So we have, this was mostly, I'm going to say, problem-oriented. Here's, here's the, the damage that we've caused. Let's stick with questions and discussion around that. Anything, Jonathan? We've only just begun. Yeah, okay. Um, Terry, the other thing I wanted to, to ask or add um, in terms of security problem was, because um, I've spent time in that South China Sea area um, doing operations, is that I think another part of a, of a, a caveat to the problem that kind of expedites this, the timeline is that even when we use resources, we don't use them efficiently. Oh, we're going to talk about that. So, like, just in terms of the fishing, it's like, okay, well, you take, let's say, seven tons of fish, but then, you know, you have farmers who are look fish farmers who are, or fish uh, fishermen who are looking for specific kinds of fish, and then they're, they're destroying everything just to get the fish that they need, and then they get rid of the rest, and sometimes that's up to 20 to 30 percent you bet. of their original catch in the first place. You bet. I, so. spent, I spent two years on a hydrofoil. I had command of a hydrofoil out of Key West. My daytime job was basically patrolling the fishing fleet um, throughout the Caribbean, making sure that they were complying and using their TEDs, their turtle extraction devices, properly. But you would be surprised. It wasn't hard to find the fleet from the trail in some cases. Depending on where we were in the Caribbean, it wasn't hard to find the fleet based upon the trail of carcasses um, that was left. Not American fishermen, thank God, um, but in other nations, they'd, it's not the same. And yes, you're right. Um, they don't care about the catch, it goes in the boat. When they finally get it out and throw it over the side, it's, it's pretty much dead. You're, you're absolutely right. You just have to speak into it. <coughs> uh, could you just def go back to slide two, define sustainable? How sustainable is it, means how that... How are you doing it? How, how, sustain What's your version? Sustainable means that you can continue to use that resource over and over and over again and in perpetuity. But this slide seems to be saying energy. I, I hope you're going beyond energy. Well, it needs to be a little bit of everything. My company is energy. I and I will tell you that the energy... The energy nexus for everything that you're talking about is what we are involved in. So we're, we're going to talk about water, we're going to talk about resources, we're going to talk about packaging, we're going to talk about food. They all tie to, to energy as well. And then my last bit of slides will show you why it's even more important that we understand how that sustainable um, ties together. Norm? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. where, they can, where they built a sustainable community uh, using seawater from the sea. Yes. Uh, and as I understand it, it was a natural process. And ultimately, they allowed that to where shrimp, pelagia, then they went into the desert uh, and uh, planted, uh, let's see, mangroves. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
process known as the New Nile Project. Uh, and again, the same group of people, but for the uh, Arab Revolution, uh, would have been working right, right now. And those seem to me a viable alternative to some of the problems that are before. Well, we, we're going to talk about some more that'll, that'll add to this, but you're absolutely right. Um, Again, that's why I say this is not a red problem, it's not a blue problem, it's not a US problem, it's a world problem. And we have, we've seen these all over the place. I'm gonna show you some pictures that I took early on um, in one of these areas. And the problem hasn't gotten any better. Um, and whether that be from a geopolitical perspective or whether that just be conditions. But in some cases, it's conditions. And we're gonna talk about conditions as to why they, they too um, are part of the bigger conversation because the conditions themselves um, are, in fact, the reasons why the instability exists. Um, and, you know, not being in uniform anymore, I could take off the gloves and maybe make some statements that may not sit so well um, with those individuals who would like to think otherwise. Um, but I can tell you that uh, we're going to have that conversation. All right, good. So what I'd like to do, and, and Norm, we're going to, if you're, if you're jumping ahead to solutions, I know he's going to get the solutions. All right, so that's why I'm going to say keep your conversation to the, the dozen slides that we had, but I know he's going to get the solutions like that a little bit later. So if you're on a laptop, um, you have a slide deck now at essentially count to 12 on, on the down button. Here. So if you're on slide number, screen number one, you're going to be at 13. So if you're on one of those, Brom, you're going you're gonna to count down. Brom, you're going to now go to slide number what? 18, so we should see 13 over here on number one. On number two, we should see 14. So add 12 to the number that you're right at. Right there. 13, 14, sense? 14 on three. You have that number in front of you at the bottom. So, Brom, you keep going, keep going, so you get to 18, right? There we go. Uh, 15, 16, we're almost there. Okay. 20. This We're missing 14. 21 over here. Going there we go. Okay, All right. here on nine. Just one more on number nine. One more. Go one more. I know. 22. There you go. We're good to go. Okay, okay good. Let's get started. Time. So now we want to work into the next question. We talked about life, but why? And more importantly, again, our effect on this environment that we're trying to protect, recognizing that is a significant portion of our globe and our food sources and our condition for tomorrow. So one of the things that we have to truthfully fess up to is our oceans have become our waste baskets. And we are in desperate straits across the globe because of the conditions that we've allowed to occur over the course of the last 50 plus years. The gyres that exist in each of our oceans are a testament to our disregard for our environment. These gyres, in some cases, are so large, the gyre in the North Pacific is twice the size of Texas. What's in it? Virtually anything that we throw out. Give me the first slop. And it's having a devastating effect, not only in the environment, but the animals that live in the environment. This is a picture of a Midway Island albatross, the very symbol of what we consider the mariner's refuge and tenant. Go to midway.com or mid, mid, midwaylife.com and there's a 10-minute documentary of a scientist who basically spent a year photographing more than 10,000 corpses of the albatross that have died on the island because they've ingested large amounts of plastics that they believe are fish in the oceans. The problem here is, is that it's not just on Midway. It's happening throughout the entire Pacific. And the materials that are being left in the oceans predominantly persist because they are plastics. And what's worse 
is those plastics, we, as we all know, contain carcinogens. As a matter of fact, the single greatest plastic that we find in our ocean, we are still having arguments landside as to whether or not we should ban the plastic bag. The plastic bag is the most significant hazard to our ocean. Why? One, because it's made of plastics that are recycled. So we have no control of its content. Therefore, it's extremely high in its contaminants. As a matter of fact, the plastic bag says on the bottom of it, this bag is not intended for the long-term storage of food products because it contains carcinogens known to cause cancer. But yet we still have arguments as to whether or not we should be inconvenienced knowing that only 20% of our bags are ever recycled. Estimations are in some areas more than 60% of our bags actually end up in our water source. Not necessarily in the ocean, but in our water sources. So, the problem with plastic bags is they're one of the plastics that break down in UV. So as the sun hits them in the ocean, they break down into their smallest particulate matter and are ingested by the food source that we then subsist 70% of the world's population. So give me a picture, give me another picture. And it's disgusting what we do. It's disgusting the events that we have seen over the course of the last number of years on just how much of an impact this is. So here's a wildlife that's gotten caught up in a fishing net. Give me the next one. This is a South Pacific Ocean after a storm. Yeah, that's garbage. That's not a pristine, you know, it's not the South Pacific Island that you would think, but this is garbage that's washed ashore after a storm. Next slide. And as we said, people are subsisting out of this. This is a Central American river bed that gets a tidal wash in and out of the ocean. These people are picking out the good stuff, fishing and leaving the rest of it just where it is. Give me another one. And this is somebody lost their dolly. This is just off the coast of Miami, Florida. Look how much trash is there. And you wonder why the coral reefs along our coastline are dying? There you go. Oh, look at diaper. Pretty cool, huh? All right. And if you think it's not happening, that's right here in Chulis Creek. 19, in 2000, when I was base commanding officer, I actually installed this boom to prevent oil from going up the Chulis estuary in case while my guys were working on the small boats, which small boat repair is done down here, that that oil would not leach into the estuary and I would have to worry about filing EPA claims. I could clean it up in the boom. This happened after a significant event on a weekend. This is 80 tons of trash. It took me four days, two cranes and 14 trucks to get it out of the bay. When I approached the city and asked them for assistance, they told me it was my problem, it was on our property. Good luck. This boom is not in place anymore. So, the five day event we just had, San Diego Bay, there it is. Eventually this ends up in the ocean. And imagine how many coastline ports we have in our more than 6,000 miles of coastline. Yes, sir. Question, sir. At the time, you were not getting the cooperation from the city that you had hoped for. Who happened to be the mayor at that time? Um, interim. Um, Congressman? No. I. I believe that was right after, um, what's his name, quit. <laughs> or Murphy? Um, Murphy. So Tony Atkins was not yet in place. Um, but there is, no, there is no process, at least not then. There was no process in place to do any of this stuff. And when I got a telephone call at 
you know, two o'clock in the morning on Saturday and said, Captain, we got a problem. I had no idea the extent that, the, and oh, by the way, um, the base, Naval Base San Diego is, sep is, is surrounded by Cholas Creek to the north, Paletta Creek to the south. Okay, so we have two on both ends. Did you just explain what a gyre is? Oh, a gyre. A gyre is a, physical, is a physical event that occurs due to the swirling of ocean currents, very similar to what happens in your bathtub when you pull the plug. The currents go around and create a dead spot. A gyre is what happens when the currents go around and create that spot in the ocean. So in the same fashion it does soap suds in your bathtub, so too does it the trash that's floating um, in the oceans. So a gyre is created as a result of that movement. Okay. Well, the good news is, is that as the oceans continue to heat, those gyres will become less relevant. Therefore, the trash will just spread further distances. So now let's go to the next good, new, good bit of news, population explosion. <laughs> The last bit of good news. We are in a point in our lifetime in which scientists call the factor of doubling. And in population, it's a crisis beyond belief because we are now experiencing our second phase of doubling. Give me the chart. Next one. From the time of creation, depending on what religion you believe, who cares? That's not relevant. But from the first man until 1850, it took us that long to get to 1.5 billion people on the face of the earth. From 1850 to 2014, we went from 1.5 to 7.2. First doubling effect. We are now doubling. Say that again. You misspoke. So say it again. From you the said seven point two. Seven point two. Not billion. Billion. That's now. Yeah. So twenty fourteen. Okay. I'm so from eighteen fifty to twenty fourteen, it took us from one point five to seven point two. Okay. So what we see now in twenty fifty is potentially nine point two to nine point four billion people. Okay, so it's a factor of doubling. That's twelve million new mouths on the face of the globe every single month. Every single month, we are adding 12 million new mouths to the equation that we just talked about. Next, hit the next one. And here's the real scary number, because if we continue at 9.3 billion, if you really want to put it in perspective, between now and 2050, we will be adding the equivalent population to the face of the globe of an India and China combined. Think about it. Here we are at 300 million, and we look at China at 1.3. By 2050, we will add a China and an India to the world's population. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And the worst part is, the Western civilized world has their population control in check. We are not experiencing a factor of double. As a matter of fact, we are experiencing a factor which is considered normal for all practical purposes of just under 2%. Now, some will say that's because of the economic constraints that most of us live in. But I would hope it's a little bit more than that. But in some regions of the world, their explosion is occurring at 6 to 7 percent. So where they're least capable of being able to provide the sustenance necessary to preserve life and protect and provide the security necessary to support those individuals, they are the least capable of doing so. And human migration is a serious crisis. How many of you know that knew that 12.2 million people today are considered refugees of climate in northern Africa? Today, 12.2 million people, Sudan, Ethiopia, Yemen, Somalia, Kenya. They're not just geopolitical instability that's causing the problem. It's the fact that they don't have any food and water. 
They have no capacity to be able to handle the population that exists in these, in these regions. And it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. And I'll put this preface in there. Many will say, who cares? But when stuff like this happens on the face of the globe, who do they look for? Who do they look to? Us. Who do they look to? Us. They look to the industrialized world to somehow figure out how to fix this. So if you look, and again, I, I left these in here so that the slide deck will be available, but I would encourage you all to go into some of these texts and read them, because these are not things that are being published in the US press. They're being covered by press outside that are telling the story of just how desperate some of these things are. And you would think that since we respond to so many of these humanitarian crises, that we would have a much better understanding of how they're developing. And more importantly, from a collective perspective, maybe start to address some of the issues associated with them before they become crises. But I would contend that 12.1 million people in refugee camps across the northern part of North Africa is just the beginning. Africa is in its 12th year of drought. The sub-Saharan Africa is in its worst condition in the history of the continent. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And for any of you, myself included, who have been there, this is heart-wrenching. Because there is nothing you can do at this particular point that's going to make it any better. And that's the sad part. It's already gone too far. And I don't know if any of you have ever met um, one of the Lost Boys, um, but their stories are absolutely incredible. And they will tell you that the civil strife that occurred in Sudan had nothing to do with the geopolitical scenarios that we want to believe. It was all about food and water. It started out because individuals were starving and they raided the farms of their, neighborings, of their neighbors. The government decided to step in and control the issue. It became a civil war. Tens of thousands of individuals marched thousands of miles to safety, creating armies of children. And still to this day, close to 4 million Sudanese are displaced across the globe because of it. Then we get to food supply. So we go from good to better, not. Food supply is a serious, serious issue and will be even more of an issue as we address population explosion and climate change. Why? Well, hit the button. First and foremost, America has become one of the most excessive in consumption and waste. 40% of all the food we grow in this country, we throw out. We throw out, 40%. If you took the equivalent of energy, it would provide $1,350 per person in the United States per year equivalent in energy. So you could basically run your home for three years before you get even close to how much energy is consumed in producing this waste. If you talked about the resource necessary to grow this in land, this is equal to the entire um, acreage of the country of Mexico. So you plant every single inch of Mexico, you water it, you cultivate it, you harvest it, you package it, you move it, you throw it out. That's who we are. So as the rest of the globe looks at the problems, what do you think they're going to look at when this becomes the issues? And I would contend that if you've been anywhere in South America or Latin America, I would contend that a lot of the things that we're dealing with on the border have a lot more to do than just the simple things that we want to believe. It's not about, in all cases, about gang violence. It isn't about the drugs. And if you don't believe so, take a trip to the Tijuana River Valley and see the way those people live. 
And they're willing to live in that condition because it's better than where they came from. And the Mexican government doesn't provide them any support whatsoever. As a matter of fact, to provide them support or subsistence is against the law in Mexico. But look at it. Global hunger is on the rise. And this is at 7.2. 1.2 billion people on the face of the earth today are clinically malnourished. And clinically malnourished from a de definition sense is that no matter how much sustenance you provide for them, no matter how much nutrition you provide for them, they have been deprived enough nutrition in their younger years that their mortality is significantly impacted. So even if you were to start feeding them all today, they would still die before the normal age because they were deprived the, the basic nutrient that allowed the development of the body in their adolescence. Every single week, 20,000 children across the face of the globe today die of lack of water and nourishment. 20,000, 5,000 a week across the globe. And when we talk about this, for those of us who have been there again, this is the wait for food abroad. This is a picture I took in Mogadishu in 1983. The first time I provided humanitarian relief to the country of Somalia. The war didn't break out until 1991. We were already providing them UNHCR relief in the early 80s. And they have been at civil war for this very reason since the 70s. And it's not just geopolitical. This is drought, no food, and a government that can't provide an answer. Give me another one. Go ahead and hit the Ron? button. Ron, hit the button there. If you would, please. And here is the kicker. Go back to the population number. If we are to feed the population that is projected to 2050, we will have to produce more food in the next 40 years than we have in the last 10,000. See a problem here? And it is major. We are being told in most cases that these are small areas of drought, that the impacts are nowhere near as significant as they truly are, and that everything's in hand. Read more, read more. The first time the World Food Bank got together with 81 major, or 105 major companies across the country, and amazingly enough, 81 of the 105 said food and world food policy is the single greatest concern going forward. And principally because population explosion and climate change. It has nothing to do with our capacity. It has everything to do with whether or not the capacity will exist into the future. That's the problem. And here is the wait for food in the United States. This is how we define our prosperity. So if you're sitting in one of these, and you know this is what they have, where do you think the conflict exists? Even knowing better that 40% of the produce that they manufacture gets thrown out. And, next, 80,000 tons of processed grain and cereals were destroyed last year here in the United States because we failed to sell them by their sell-by date. 80,000 tons. And those are only the numbers that I could find because these are from the major manufacturers. Grocery stores are not required to tell you how much they throw out from their shelves. They're not required. This is just what got returned because it couldn't sell it. Yes, sir. You gotta, gotta grab a mic. Sir, if you had 
power over the United States Congress, what would you recommend that they do immediately to change United States law to affect situations like this? What should be mandatory in the United States economy to stop this type of waste? Um, we'll, we'll get to the, the, the how do I believe, but I would tell you that um, I think that we as a culture need to stop making decisions based on quarterly returns. Quarterly returns. Based on quarterly returns. Based on quarterly returns. We need to stop making decisions based on short-term economic returns and start making decisions that have everything to do with all the issues that I'm talking about. And I would tell you that the one thing that hurts me the most as an American citizen is that there is one single American who goes to bed hungry. We threw out 80,000 tons. 80,000 tons. And 40% of our produce. But yet we still have people who go to bed hungry in this country. Because we prohibit the sale to protect the commercial return. If you want to have a serious adult conversation, we have to start talking about what does it mean? What does this mean? And how do we change the way we do business? Because it isn't comfortable. And oh, by the way, maybe it doesn't come out that way, but I'm a Republican. We don't hold it against you. Good. Because again, <laughs> this is not a red, it's not a blue thing. Let's hang on one more slide, and then we'll oh. get into conversation, OK? Hang, hang on just one more second. Let's, let's okay. finish up your last slide here. So let's get to the last slide, because this one is as important, if not more important. If you had invested in gold or silver in San Diego County in 1974, which would you have been better off in that investment? Gold or silver in 74. Or uh, gold or water? Oh. Water. You'd be 843% better off if you had invested in gold. You'd be 1,162% better off if you had invested in water. The truth is, however, that no matter how much beauty it adds and adorns the necks of women and their fingers and the likes, they can go their entire life never having touched an ounce. But they can't go three days without water. But yet we treat that particular resource as if it's no different than air that it's abundant and ever-present. This, more so than any other resource that we have on the face of the globe, is more like an endowment than anything else the good Lord has given us. Because there's only so much, and no matter how much energy we put into it, we cannot produce enough water from the oceans to recreate the opportunities for the population we're talking about especially since we have the capacity today. Give me the numbers. And 85% of the world's population live in the driest half of the planet. 783 million people have no access to water at all. There are portions of our population that have not seen clean water in their entire life. 40% of the Indian population has never seen a toilet. Yeah, wow. There are places on the earth where people still don't have clothes. The average expenditure of 25, a little over 25% of the Indian population is $1.25 a day. That's what they subsist on. 25% of 1.1 billion people. So more than the population of the United States subsists on $1.25 a day, and they think they got it good. Is there another one on that one? I don't think so. Six to eight million people. No, nope, nope, that's the next that. slide. Go back on that last one, will you? Okay, good. So that's that next 12. More good news, right? Yep. So let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's stay with these 12 for this next uh, couple minutes. Conversation or questions around what you just heard or what you just saw. Brom? Yeah. Just a second, Brom. Let me get you. This? Um, water, if there is some. It's, it, it's on. Just speak water. loudly.
percent of the produce is always discarded by the grocery chains up there, and, and you feed a lot of people with it. Um, but I've seen even places in Portland where uh, some of these grocery chains just say we have to destroy it and put it in a dumpster. And if you go to the managers of those stores, tell the Samaritan law, indemnifies them, they don't know what the Samaritan law is, and they say, well, the boss said we have to destroy it. So I feel that one way to handle that situation is to go to, you know, if you can ever do it, you know, state and federal legislators to say that those, all that, that stuff that's no good has to get recycled to food banks. Los Angeles has a big food bank. San Diego here is very puny compared to what I've seen. Yep. But that, you know, that's the procedure that has to follow because they have to force and legislation these grocery chains to do it. It's, and it is a huge problem because we have more lawyers than we do doctors. And the truth is, is that many of our laws are written to protect from lawsuits. And they're not willing to take a stand and create an opportunity because if somebody should happen to get sick, they sue them. It's, it, it's their gravy train to prosperity from here on out. You can be living on the street, um, get a meal at a food kitchen, get sick, and you're living in a mansion in Beverly Hills. That's the system we have, though, but again, it's a, it is a huge problem. And again, is any, I don't know, uh, I forget the name of the movie. Um, it's about uh, three lost boys. It just recently aired. Um, but anyway, the three lost boys, one of the boys get a job in um, Kansas City. And he works for a grocery store. And every day he's told to bring the basket of produce and dump it in the dumpster. Well, he runs across one afternoon two homeless persons, one young lady and, a, and an older man, and they ask him for some of the produce. The store owner sees him giving the produce to these hungry homeless and is fired on the spot. Um, and in the case of what's there, it's again another one of those realities where even the people who have come from these extreme conditions can't believe what's happening in the course of their duties because those dumpsters are locked. And as a matter of fact, in San Francisco, there used to be a whole, pot, a whole group of individuals who had a, um, an agreement, if you will, with store owners that they would actually give them a call on their phone, they would place them in the dumpster, and they would, they would remove them. So they'd leave them in the boxes, they'd place them in the dumpster, they'd remove them, and they would take care of it. Now there's an ordinance in San Francisco that says you have to lock your dumpster. So we fixed it. Dan? Yes, sir. Yeah, Dan Hendrickson. Uh, well, one of those things, what's the ratio of lawyers to engineers at the <laughs> EPA? I, Everything I, I see in the media is someone's got a lawsuit against a company where they want a judgment. But there's all kinds of stuff that could be done. It's, we, Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. And again, I think that many of the things that we do from a regulatory perspective do not take into consideration what's necessary to address these problems. Um, and they, they are, and we do have to, um, I think in some cases, go back. Um, it's, it, some of the laws that were written, you know, they may have been great in the 60s when the, the world of prosperity was upon us and those things were not part of our, our, our psyche. I mean, we didn't have the, the, the ocean problems. We didn't have the explosion problems. We didn't have the energy problems. So we wrote regulation and law that seemed good at the time, but now we're reluctant to go back and say, how can we do this differently? And every time you mention it, oh my goodness, you're bringing down the very mantle by which we, we have made things work. And I, again, that's why we have to have this adult conversation. One more here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. John? Yes. Thank you. Len, Thank it you. seems with uh, the burgeoning population crisis, if we were somehow to be able to come off that precipice, just like the climate precipice, and back down over a century or two, bring the numbers way down, we have so many less problems. Why, from your perspective, is, uh, is it such a taboo in some corners to talk about population control? <laughs> Um, because, it, because it 
goes at the very heart of, I think, what most people believe is their right, um, and that is to per perpetuate the species. And, you know, again, depending on what religion, I don't know any religions that don't um, actually support the, this is what we were intended to do, join and create. Um, the question is, are we, are we smart enough about what that means? Do we have a, a, a different conversation in those areas of the world where population means seven, eight, ten, and not one or two. Um, and I think that's, that's the harder conversation because, again, where this explosion is occurring, and you can take a look at the doubling that occurred between 1850 and today, the bulk of that is in the industrialized world. We, we did it. We grew from a, a small nation in 1850 um, to now 303 million. I mean, from 1950 to today, we've doubled our population indigenous, not with everybody else coming in. We've doubled our population since, since the 50s. So um, we, we've got that. But in, in places where um, the mortality rate is in crisis, the numbers are huge. Um, and in some places, there are 7, 10, 12, um, and I don't want to get into the whole idea of, you know, the Irish Catholic and family of 12. And it just, there's so much emotion wrapped around it. But again, it's a part of the conversation that we have to have. Um, and where do you control them? Because the one-offs are going to happen. Um, but what do you do? And, and oh, by the way, we, we know in our, in our recent past that attempts to do that have been almost catastrophic. Um, I just... Just got finished um, the beginning of last year. I read a report. I shared it with Peter. Um, a, a genealogist um, has looked at the Chinese population, the true indigenous Chinese. If, in fact, she's correct, in three decades, there will be no indigenous Chinese left on the face of the earth. Why? Because for four decades, they've had a one policy. And many of the female population of the true Chinese culture were killed at birth or aborted for the sake of a male. The male to female population in China, I think, is eight to one. So as the Chinese male looks to procreate, they will look outside of the indigenous Chinese population. Within three decades, potentially, the Chinese strain as a purity will disappear. Now, I don't know how well her model's built out, but you can see how that potentially could happen because the exact same things today are being forecast for redheads. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's, it's true. I mean, the redhead is not the dominant, um, and the redhead potentially, over the course of time, will disappear. Um, Sorry for you redheads in the audience. And it, predominantly, it will predominantly occur because of the introduction of darker hair into the Asian or to the um, uh, European um, and uh, Caucasian race. And the redhead will become the... At least the IQ will go up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pretend, Pete, you didn't say that, but okay. <laughs> I'm going to save that. you till next. Can I save you till next time? Okay, good. So what we'd like to do is flip to the next twelve. So the user at the laptops, you count. You know, you count twelve more. You have the number in front of you. We have two more sets of this. So we'll start over here on number one. It should, you at number one, we should be at tw slide twenty-five. You're almost there. There's twenty-five. So again, you should have that number in front of you. Please go to the number that you have and and. Uh, we will get started right away, 25, 26, 27 over here, 28, 29. We're really good, Glenn, so good. carry on. Okay, so we're going to go through these pretty fast because this is kind of a, here we go, um, round two, round three. As you saw in California, things are, the, the water condition across the globe is not in great shape. And California is a perfect example. Things are bad and getting worse. Despite the fact that the governor has told you all we're in our third year of drought, from a climatological perspective, we are actually in our 12th year of drought. 
Some would even argue that maybe we're approaching the 13th year of drought because from a climatological perspective, drought is a condition in which the precipitation per annum is not achieved or exceeded. We are in 12 years. For every year that you are in drought, it takes three years to recover. So that's the continued use, the restoration, and the principle for, conti for continuation in the endowment. Because in that comes evaporation, um, all the other processes. So it takes three years to get the one. We're in our 12th year. And it's getting worse. The conditions are serious in California. And people don't want to talk about it. As a matter of fact, I've already had people who tell me, San Diego's out of the, tr out of the, out of the, the uh, problems. We got it all. It's been raining the whole month of December. We're up to snuff. Seriously. Let's look at it. The picture to the left is Folsom Lake in California, 2011. The picture on the right is Folsom Lake, September 27th, 2014. It's dry. When the forecast was made in 2011 in California about the prognosis, the politicos decided that the severe conservation measures suggested were not necessary and therefore delayed in their implementation. But what's really critical to understand here, because this is where it all comes together, and here's where sustainable, again, comes to it. See what's at the end of that lake? A hydroelectric dam. See what's at the end of that lake? A dam. California has lost 13% of its hydroelectric capacity in 2014. So you wonder why your rates can't stabilize? It's because the single greatest renewable energy in California is running out. Water. Lake Mead is in crisis. At the end of Lake Mead is the Hoover Dam. The single largest hydroelectric capacity, 1.2 gigawatts, provides all of the Southwest with its energy. If we don't control and the water doesn't change differently, the water that we provide is different, 20 months from now, the Hoover Dam will cease to produce energy. 20 months. 20 months. It is at what they consider to be critical. And here's the real kicker. They knew about this about 14 or 15 years ago, and they spent close to $3 billion to lower the generators 27 feet. We can't go any further. And the reason why it can't go any further is because the dam itself will collapse. Because it no longer has the stability. If you understand the, the dynamics of a dam like the Hoover Dam, it's built in an arch. Because its stability is provided by the hydro, hydraulic pressure, as well as the pressure of the arch itself to hold the dam together. When it goes below a certain level, the pressure of the arch, oh, by the way, the Hoover Dam cement is still setting up. It has not hardened in the core. We'll come under extreme stress, and people are wondering whether or not the dam itself will survive. We built it for $5 million because we were in the midst of the TVA and other issues from the Depression. So for $5 million, we built the Hoover Dam. If we had to rebuild the Hoover Dam, it would be somewhere between 180 and 250 billion if we could get it through the permitting process. Now, with that, well, that's part of the problem. OK, with that comes even more issues. So let's give me the next one. Because we talk about California, but we don't want to talk about the other issues across the globe. How many of you know that San Paulo, a mega city of the world, 12.2 million people, will potentially be out of water in just 60 days? Just 60 days. So right now. So imagine the geopolitical instability that's occurring in Brazil 
as people begin to face the idea that they will have no water in a city of 12 million people. And the real crisis is, again, that the decision not to address this happened over a course of elections. And we'll talk about what's happening because there's some other things in here that are really important. And we are, we, we are literally facing this on a, on a massive perspective. So here, Brazil, which is in, oh, by the way, a rainforest, a rainforest, no longer have water flowing down the estuaries to provide the reservoirs water for these populations. Here, give me the next click. Australia, how many people knew that Australia was in a 15 year drought? Okay, so we didn't hear a whole lot of that while it was happening. But the truth is, is that in 2010, Australian farmers were left with a devastating choice. Water for them or water for their husbandry. They made the ultimate choice and 10,000 animals were left to die in the fields. This is a farmer surveying his once healthy herd of sheep, but they no longer exist. Now, Australia has managed to take care of their problem using desalinization, but they have increased their energy bill by 24% because they're using principally reverse osmosis. And reverse osmosis is eight times more energy intense than any other form of purification we know. Serious issue. And again, not renewable. Tied to a finite resource. We need a very critical time here. Um, the, um, the, the 150 installations exist around the world now where you can reduce the amount of demand by 60% by electric coagulation process. It's now proven and tested by Office of Naval Research, and I show you reports from Livermore and many other agencies. And um, I'm having the California Water Resource Board is saying you have to have UV and reverse osmosis, uh, plus um, uh, advanced um, cl clear clarification at the last stage. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm trying to show the city and the public works the valid proof when many federal agencies, state agencies, laboratories, universities, existing installations around the world, that you can do this process with 40% of the energy you normally need, and no chemical treatment, and no, uh, no um, aeration, and, and they're saying, well, I'm sorry, but the Water Resource Board insists that you have ultrafiltration and you have reverse osmosis. We can get 98% uh, of the uh, recovery and 2% reject with this process. So the only issue there is if you have a lot of sodium chloride, you do need reverse osmosis and ultrafiltration. And I have to still find out what the influence is from the testing they've done on this demonstration site but I'm about to start making a big case about this to the mayor and the council members because, and also that um, it costs only, you know, maybe about uh, $40 million for a five, for a 50 million, if I remember the numbers, $40 million for a 50 million gallon, gallon per day plant, whereas they want to spend 10 to 20 times that for their process. And the membranes keep failing. Right. So right in our own backyard, the corruption is really horrible and you can't get public works to really admit it and there's just, they're tied up in all the regulations and the engineering is just saying, well, let's check it out. But we still have to use UV and, uh, and RO. So we have, a, we have to fight it right here or we're not going to have water here. It's, it's everywhere because it's, it is in part the introduction of new technologies that will afford us the opportunity to solve some of these problems. And RO is not the best process. And from an energy perspective, from an environmental perspective, uh, for those of you who understand anything about RO, the one thing that you have to... Um, understand with reverse osmosis, if you don't know what that means, is you take salt water, you push it through a membrane, um, and you, you push it through a number of membranes, and eventually you get fresh water on one side, and you get what's called brine. Um, and that brine um, is a significant waste product of a reverse osmosis process that we still don't know how to handle properly. So while we, while we are doing it, and one of the things that, um, you know, I learned this the hard way, 
I built an RO system out at San Clemente Island. And in order for me to be able to increase when the SEALs did more work on San Clemente, I needed to figure out a way to handle the brine introduction to the environment that occurred as a result of my osmosis. Despite how much I put into the dispersal pattern, I was unable to achieve adequate dispersal um, in, a, in a locality, in a specific locality to pass EPA standards. So I wasn't able to go any bigger, um, which meant a significant increase. But more importantly, my plant is tiny compared to what they're proposing in Carlsbad, tiny. So, Bill. Sir, isn't it true that we have a precedent in the South Bay, in Imperial Beach, where the salt is concentrated and actually sent to the Midwest to melt the ice on the it United is. States, for it example? Is. It is, but uh, we'll talk about sea level rise and how that's going to change, too. I know it takes energy to do uh, reverse osmosis, and I think, is Australia pretty sunny? It is, and, and, and the interior parts is, of it. And, 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 and the interior is pretty sunny, and is less populated in, in the interior. Isn't such thing as solar power for this? The, 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 the problem with solar in those type of concentrations is the fact that, again, solar is really built in a G, DG capacity, so be able to, to, in order to be able DG, to what is DG? distributed generation. So if you commercially produce energy a long distance from its need, you need to produce one and a quarter times more than you require. And it's a, it's a voltage thing. It's an electricity thing. Right. E equals IR. No matter how that. hard you You always step it up later on down the road with, with batteries and et cetera, right? But, but you, can, you, can, you can solve that problem if, you're, if there is sufficient capacity to be able to store. And the problem is, is that we don't know how to store it um, in sufficient quantity to be able to operate the plant. The biggest problem with RO is it isn't something you can turn on and turn off in the same fashion. You have to be able to maintain pressure, otherwise you go through that whole process. Once you get the entire system back up, you dump virtually everything that's in the system until you get quality of water on the other side. It, well, they should look more into that technology. There's, there's lots of there's technology. There's so much sun out there, and it is yeah. sustainable with the sun. Yep. He's going to yeah. show you that. Let's, I'm let's, going to show you that. Let's let him continue, because there's another. Uh, so we're, you're going to see about so much sun out there at the end. I've seen this yeah. slide deck. So let's let him continue. Okay, so this is happening all over the globe. And again, there are studies from virtually everywhere that show just how big of a deal this is. Does this one have a, a yes, button? Yes, it does. Yeah, give this one a button. So this is Central Southwest Asia and the climate perspective just how much of a drought and humanitarian crisis is being, um, they're actually experiencing today. So hit another one. Um, here is um, a study that, again, not being in uniform anymore, um, I will tell you that I think Peter's got it right. If you're interested in reading this study, um, I would suggest you do so, because what this really points out is that the reason the instability in Syria became a crisis of the magnitude in which it did was because the government of Assad virtually, uh, virtually ignored 1.4 million people in the heartland of Syria through a 15 and a half year drought. And oh, by the way, Shia and Sunni concerns are all part of this relative makeup. So, throughout history, you can revel in a number of different experiences where populations are desperate for virtually anything, and in course arrives ISIS, guaranteeing the opportunity for That's not what they're selling. They are not, they are not selling crisis. They are selling security, preservation in the name of Allah. They are selling to the locals and did create an opportunity for the establishment of a caliphate for that very purpose. And I would contend, and here's where it really stretches, 
This is no different than Hitler in 1932. No different than Mussolini in 1938. Or Mao. Or Chiang Kai-shek. The Spanish Inquisition. It's no different. As a matter of fact, there are relevant studies to show that most of the major conflicts of the 21st century can be linked to a climatic change in an environment which created an instable population which fostered the opportunity for revolution. And the Middle East, I believe, is in the heart of what is, in fact, climate change. Because Syria is the hottest place on the face of the earth. And again, I've experienced on both ends. I stood atop the North Pole at 91 below zero. I was in the Persian Gulf in 1995, it was 141 degrees at 11 o'clock in the morning. Ugh. So you can imagine what it's like. But these people, the breadbasket of Syria, have been without water for 15 years. And Assad basically turned a blind eye and left them to their own demise. Why, do you, why would you not think that political instability would occur? It has nothing to do with all the rest of this stuff. And then it just spread from one to the next, to the next, to the next. No different. And we're going to talk about some of the other things that, from a climate perspective, are influenced. So here's another one. Latin America. I already told you that San Paulo, a population of 12 million people, is virtually going to run out of water in 60 days. Here's the true crisis, that for the last Eight and a half months, fresh water has been turned off. Fresh water has been turned off to the lesser populations of the region for the sake of providing stability, geopolitical stability, during the elections in San Paulo. So the poor have virtually been denied water. It has created a humanitarian crisis in Latin America like none ever before seen. Stability. Excuse me? There you go. They're going to do the Olympics. And here we are on the other end, the most wasteful culture on the face of the earth. We throw out, we, we waste 7 billion gallons a day. 7 billion. And to just show you how incredible that is, the average shower in the United States is 13 minutes. 13 minutes. At USD, we tracked it because we had a device. And we actually had a, a female who took two 33-minute showers every day. And you know, it was pretty incredible because we had a device. Um, and so we think she actually put her timer on her. And we knew it was a female. Oh, so that just in case. Because it's, yeah, sure. I don't know who it was. It was just, it was in the female dorm. So we had a male in the female dorm taking 33 minute showers, we had a bigger problem. <laughs> but what we did is we monitored and looked at what that was. But here's the kicker. I know that you can survive with a three minute shower every day. I did it for nearly 30 years and almost continue. The real question, that's right, because if you went over three minutes, there's a blanket party waiting for you right outside the shower because potentially you're gonna go on water hours and that ain't cool. Submarine is a Hollywood. Well, I would tell you in the Persian Gulf, it was a Hollywood. Because you had, sometimes you had to take two and three showers a day um, just, to, just to cool your core temperature. But anyway, if you could get water that was cold, because it came out of the spigot at 92 degrees. Um, but anyway, if we were to all just reduce our showers by three minutes, let's just say three minutes. So we're not going to take a 13-minute shower. We're going to take a 10-minute shower. And we say that everyone in America does the same thing, and we won't say that all 300 million take a shower, OK? Because uh, my wife raised three boys. I know that they don't take a shower every day, um, not, at least not until they're, they're teenagers. Um, so we're going to say 200 million. 200 million Americans reduce their, water, their showers by three minutes. If we did that, America would save 64,000 acre feet of water every single day. 
64,000 acre feet. An acre, seven and a half times higher. than the atmosphere, 64,000 acre feet a day. Just so you can see this, the first bar there is the average, it's US, the US and then Australia and then Italy. So those are the average daily water usage by liters per person and US is, and, La and Australia are the first two. First two. And Australia just went through a major crisis. But anyway, if we did that, in 38 months we'd fill Lake Superior. So we can all have an effect on how this works. And again, this is a corpus that we have been completely disrespectful of for more than four decades. So we have to figure out how to do this differently because this is a piece we can't survive without. And it's creating major problems already across the globe. The snowfall and the glacier in the, in the Himalayas is already caused major issues between India and China. Both of these nations, 1.3 and 1.1 billion, subsist from the same source of water. The Himalayas have not had an average snowfall in almost a decade. There are portions of the Himalayan glaciers that are no longer a trace of anything that looks like a glacier. And this is the principal source of water for these individuals. The upticks of right disputes in Texas, 800%. JW's from Texas. Do you know that 50 communities in Texas have closed their doors? Not because they're not economically capable of maintaining themselves, but they have no water. 50 communities. Next, and here is even a more interesting one because I found this one res just researching some other stuff, but these are wars between the states, fought both physical and in the courts in the 21st century, potential because of water. And this is everything from grazing rights to water. And just what a major impact we have gone to war statewise in our history because of drought. And it's going to happen again because of drought. And again, in Texas alone, the, eight, the uptick of lawsuits to water for ac or access to water is up 800%. All right, so now let's talk about the, the real devil in the room, elephant in the room, climate. Not weather change, climate. There's a huge difference. Climate is something that happens over a course of a long period of time. For we climatologists, we like to say 35 to 100 years. 35 is a trace, 100 is a critical element in time, and we can use that to gauge where climate is changing over time. Weather is the resultant of air masses in the movement of our atmosphere that cause things to occur on an hour to hour basis. They are different. As a matter of fact, in climate, because of climate change, weather conditions are significantly different based on things that happen within our atmosphere that we may not be, be able to track or model or show how they're actually occurring. And I'm going to show you how this is, a, is the case because since 1970, there's a 200% increase in the number of extreme weather events that have occurred on the face of the globe. And the truth is, is that our climate has not changed this drastically in the last six, six, 65 million years. And again, it's changing at 10 times the rate than the past 65 million years. So much so that the models that we use as meteorologists are no longer forecasting properly for long term. And here NASA predicts that while things are bad, it's gonna get a lot worse. And please note, these are not climate issues. This is a scale on a model that shows the potential for precipitation 
over time. And what's really important to understand here is in this particular model, when the NASA guys did this, this was in the 80s, or actually in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, they predicted the 2000 to 2009. And this is an update to that forecast because they were way off. Their forecast didn't show anything what 2000 to 2009 actually looked like. So they went back in and adjusted the variables so that they could get a fair representation of what that precipitation model would provide for them. So they then used that same model and they forecast 2030, 2060, 2090. And what you see is what's wet gets wetter, what's dry gets drier. And the extreme conditions of each of those climates are associated with major changes that are occurring within our atmosphere. Because of this, you will see that in most cases, again, if you look at the bread baskets of the world, over the course of time, less and less precipitation occurs in those regions, and not by a little bit, but by tenfold. The real significant issue here is, I have a friend who is actually part of the NASA team. He continued on in his meteorological career, now works for NASA, and helps NOAA do the forecasts for the upper atmosphere. They turned the project off three years ago because the model doesn't work. So for the past three years, NASA and NOAA scientists have been trying to explain how the variables are changing and how fast they're changing so that they can have a better model of prediction. So again, from a scientist, if, you don't, if your variables don't match, if you don't properly address each of the variables, the equation can't equal. And what we're seeing today is they don't equal. No matter what you do to the model, it's changing so fast that the variable of that model itself is not predicting what you would have expected to. It's one of the reasons why, when, if you can remember back far enough, oh my god, when we're going to hit 350 parts per million, in, oops, we missed that one by 19 years, 350 parts per million, we reached 19 years ahead of schedule. The model didn't work. We went back in and we adjusted that model based upon the escalated scale by which we saw 300 to 350 parts per million, and we forecast 400 parts per million. And we said 400 parts per million would be reached when? Anybody remember? 2032. We got it now. We said we were going to get to 400 parts per million by 2032 if the introduction of carbon continued at the pace by which the first forecast was provided. On October 13, 2013, we reached 400 parts per million. And oh, by the way, carbon introduced to our environment is in the atmosphere for 100 plus years. A hundred plus years. There is no known physical way of sequestering. It happens through natural process. But what's really important to understand about this is that the dynamics are completely different to include the fact that there are portions of the ocean, and oh, by the way, again, a, a physical note for everybody, the ocean sequesters more carbon than all the forests combined all the ice caps combined. The ocean water sequesters carbon at a significantly greater level than does anything else on the face of the Earth. There are portions of the globe's ocean which are now saturated in carbon and are releasing large quantities of carbon to the atmosphere. They can't hold anymore. It's the principle of physics. They just simply can't hold anymore. So now the dynamics change because this model is predicting that somehow that sequestration process, both from an ice perspective on normal, because ice sequesters actually eight times more than, a tr than trees, but the ice cap's melting. So it's not sequestering at the same rate. The model just simply isn't working. And then you have these people who will come to you and say, you know what, this just this BS. Man can't be doing this. Really, this is a chart of the world's carbon influx based on time. 
Happen to notice something strange? 1850, the introduction of the internal combustion engine. Wow. Look at the, sc look at the scope by which the introduction now occurs. So man can't possibly be the source, right? Click. Wrong. Who's got the click? You're right. You're right. Because of all of the other times in which carbon has been introduced to our atmosphere, throughout the 65 million years, there have been two other things that have happened. There have either been topological or astrological events. We have had no significant volcanic eruptions. The magnitude that would change our carbon in the atmosphere. And for all we know, um, I'm sure that we all know that from this point to that point, we have no, had no significant astrological events that have occurred on the face of the globe. The last astrological event um, that we know of wiped out the dinosaurs. That's a significant event that caused a major shift in the climate throughout the globe. So as this all begins to heat up, and the reason, one, of the, one of the things I want to point out is everybody keeps pointing to this because these are the ice ages that occur, and you can see that these are the, the levels. Over the course of the last 650,000 years, we have never been above 300 parts per million. Now all of a sudden from 18 or from 1960 to today, we go from 300 to 400 in just a few years. And it's escalating, increasing the number at a rate sixfold. So we are introducing carbon six times faster than we were just a decade ago. So that's who we are. Now, this doesn't even begin to address the methane problem. That you guys talked about a couple of last week, right? So with this comes a temperature change. And that temperature change is now equating to massive changes in our ice caps and other regions throughout the globe that maintain the stability of our environment. Give me the pop. Why is it important? Well, for one reason, oceanographers know that there's a cyclic advance of our world's oceans over the course of 200 years. So we have normally seen over 200 years a rise and fall of the ocean. We are in the normal rise of the world's oceans. So from a geologic perspective, you can expect if everything were to return to absolute normal, the oceans should rise an additional 17 inches before the end of the century. This chart shows who's affected by 17 inches of normal sea rise. So you can see all on the western seaboard, all along the coast of Africa, and virtually all of the Pacific Rim. Hence, Admiral Locklear's statement that the Pacific region is in desperate security concerns when it comes to global warming. Next. Oh, we're right here. Okay, so our thermal profile is changing, and it is a significant concern. You can see this, and you see, you can go on the, you got the web, and you'll see the little notes that say, oh, yeah, look, here's a 10% increase. Here's a, the stuff's pack ice, and that means nothing. It's the sheet ice that we're really concerned about. It's important because that's 40, 50, 60 feet deep. This is the sheet ice. We have lost more than 20% of the polar ice cap since 1979. Now, why that's a really big concern is um, will be uncovered in the next slide. Oh, no, give me the next one. And here's where this all comes to play. Our thermodynamic profile of the Earth is in serious jeopardy. Again, as the Earth continues to heat up, the oceans are doing exactly what you would expect them to do in the same fashion that you would this cup. Put a block of ice in it, and over time, BTU are exchanged. That ice begins to melt. The, the temperature of that water then becomes consistent with its surroundings. This chart 
shows you the results of the deep ocean profile conducted in 2010 and how the Earth's oceans are absorbing the heat. So the deepest portions of the ocean, which are the most critical to the ocean's health, are rising at a rate 40 times that of normal. And why is that important? Because ocean currents are not created because of weather. The thermodynamics of the ocean are created by temperature differences. As the ocean becomes more equal, the less the current then becomes. Upwelling and downwelling are critical to the stability of our oceans and their health. This environment, as you can see, because land releases heat 50 times faster than water. Because water only exchanges heat for the first 12 to 20 meters, depending on where you are in the globe, which is why submariners love the thermocline. But the fact is, is that the temperature difference on land can go very fast, up, down. But it's pretty consistent and has been since the beginning of time. We dissipate about 60 degrees every day. And 60 degrees provides us a balance. But we're no longer releasing 60 degrees in a balance. It's being absorbed in the oceans, and it's being absorbed by the land masses. So the more we absorb, the more heat we absorb, the more there's a requirement for us to throw some of it out. The more carbon we introduce to our environment, the less capable that exchange occurs. Okay, so uh, just a, a few questions I promised you. Uh, uh, you, had a, you still have your question? Or has it been answered? If it's been answered, that's okay. Um, I, I was just going to add to uh, his question about the, um, why the population control is sensitive to cer certain populations. And I recently took environmental science class, and they discussed how uh, the, the population of children means the labor they need for traditional agricultural society. So it's not just the region. Right. On top of that, it's their retirement system and all that home economy system. Yep. The uh, agrarian the, 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 insurance births. Well, the third world agrarian culture through time have relied on large birth rates, especially males. Yeah. Even, even in the United States. I mean, look back to our colonial and Western periods. They tried to produce as much as they could because that's what provided them farm. Okay. And um, we've, we've also seen that when, um, when we have an abundance of food and there's safety, there's less population. And when we have war and we have where there's a lot of death, then we have overpopulation. It's just a natural occurrence that happens right. in the plant kingdom and the human kingdom. Females will re will overlay three, four times a month if you wipe out, try to wipe out a population. So it's when you are able to give all the needs to a population is really the way to control a population. Maslow. You get to a decent living standard, you have two parents, two kids. We, we, we need to apply Maslow in our larger conversation about world security. What I'd like to do, I, I want to acknowledge we're almost at 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I had told uh, the Admiral we'd try to end by 8. He, he has another 11 slides. So um, you've been in a graduate course much? here, obviously. Uh, for those of you that need to leave, please leave quietly. If you can stay, I'm going to say we're probably another 20 minutes. I can go through faster than that. Okay. Yeah. So can you hang on, Brom? Hang on, Brom. Just so we're going to we're going to do this last set. He's going to power through them, and, <coughs> and then a dialogue here at the end. So uh, I, I appreciate your patience. Let's set up so we have the last set of slides up here on. Number one, we should be at 30. Is that 35 right now, number one? Is that right, JW? Oh, sorry, 37. Okay, 37, 38. So if you'll start there on the first one over here, and then I believe you're ready okay. to go. 
So th th this is a four-part series, so you're getting it all in condensed in about an hour, two hours here. But uh, sea level rise, again, one of the issues that we have to deal with is I gave you the forecast of what it would look like if it were just 17. That's the normal. So if you take the IPP, IPCC, worst case scenario, best case scenario, what have you, we're still looking at two and a half to four feet. Potentially, if the caps should melt at a rate in which the new studies show, because there are a series of scientists who have already forecast that we are past the point of no return. So in the next 200, 200 years, our ice caps will cease to exist unless a major event occurs globally that then reverses the trend. Um, but again, that's 200 years down the road. The real issue here is not the rise. The real issue here is intensified storm surge. On a global scale, for most coastal regions, some of this has been built in. As a matter of fact, in most regions, it's already part of their planning factor that mean high or high is the point by which the surge is then calculated, and that's how we begin to do our, our, our programming and planning. But when we raise that level, and we understand that the intensity of the storms have increased, that storm surge, next button, now presents completely different dynamics into all those regions that I pointed out on the chart 35 over here. So recognize that with a category two storm, there's a five to seven foot surge associated with 96 to 110 miles an hour. Virtually all storms that hit the United States are category two or better. Almost all of them. We have very, very few category one storms that actually make contact with the United States. They're mostly category two and better. As a matter of fact, Sandy was a category four when she made initial landfall. Next slide. So, given that, what do cities like this have to look forward to? Where is this? Miami. Miami. <laughs> next button, hit the next button. Because the average height, oh, too fast, too fast, too fast. There you go. The average height of Miami is just five feet. The bridge that allows the Miami population to go from Miami to mainland is only 12 feet above sea level. A category four storm in Miami will decimate Miami in its entirety. A lot of Florida, if you look at the whole thing, but here's, here's just what you have. And oh, by the way, next. And if you think it's not possible, that's the Philippines. Hit it. December 6, 2014, overnight, 1.28 million homeless. Now, add to this three, 17 to four feet. The Philippines are a US protectorate. 1,015 US citizens occupied the islands of the Philippines. 1,015 islands occupied by Filipinos who are American citizens live on islands that are today just over four feet above sea level. Overnight, we could create 30 million American homeless. These are all American citizens. 30 million overnight. And that's just one portion of the region because Indonesia, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, virtually all of them, Bangladesh. I did Operation Sea Angel 1 and wrote the deployment order for Operation Sea Angel 2 into Bangladesh. 40,000 wiped out in an afternoon. When we arrived, we couldn't tell the difference between 
human bodies and cows. In the most populated region of the world, in where they have no friends. On the Burmese border, between Bangladesh, India, and that country, they're ordered to shoot on site. So what do we do when we create 40, 50, 60,000 refugees as the conditions of the lowest, most pop lowest to sea level, most populated region of the world in one of these events? What do we do? So when we had the tsunami in Phuket, who was the first people there? Not our country, but we were the first there. We're talking about 1.28 million just from the 6th of December. What happens when this becomes full scale? Is there another one that one? I don't think so. And the truth is, is that our needs and our wants are out of balance. For stability, we have to recognize that the resources that, are, uh, that offer us the opportunity to provide for all of the parts, and here's where sustainable comes in, for all of the parts of everything we've talked, our needs, mankind's needs, and our wants are out of balance. Every single one of the resources that are necessary to provide for our stability, our prosperity, and our lifestyle are finite. Every one of them. Makes no difference. I mean, we're even charging great this, this lithium ion stuff. We're almost at the point, and the forecast is today, 12 years from now, there will be insufficient quantity of lithium to produce the battery stock necessary to provide the renewable space. The only other place we can get it from is the ocean, which is abundant, but incredibly expensive to extract. So, the bottom line of this is that if we don't get our needs and our wants in check, the 20th century is the bloodiest century in mankind's history. More conflict occurred in the 20th century than any period before it. More people lost their lives. And virtually every one of the major conflicts resulted over control and access to resources. The 21st century marked the difference between ideological and economic prosperity in conflict. Every single major conflict of the 20th century can be tied back to control of resources. The Japanese did not attack Pearl Harbor for any other reason but to keep the United States from influencing and having an opportunity to control and deny their ability to pig iron and fuel. The crisis in diplomatic ties that resulted in the Japanese decision to attack Pearl Harbor had everything to do with resources. Exactly the same thing in Europe. And while we may not think so, even the, the instability that we created as a result of the First and Second World War had everything to do with resources. We created the mess in the Middle East. And if you don't believe so, read A Peace to End All Peace. It is without a doubt the best capturing of Western influence in the Middle East, which caused the greatest amount of problems and is now exacerbated by the climate changes and geopolitical instability that exists in the region. And this is where the rubber meets the road. This is a chart which basically shows our production, our discovery, and our uncontrolled need. And if you look at where are we and how much resource is available, you have to keep in mind that discovery does not necessarily mean extraction. Because just 10 years ago, half of what we consider today to be part of this 
scale was declared by our major oil companies as unachievable and not economically feasible to secure. Today, all of a sudden, we've added this huge surplus of opportunity. And I would tell you that this is what we really should be concerned about. And again, I'll give you another little note why instability potentially rests in this fossil environment and why it's a bigger concern for us overall because these type of things happen. Europe is scared to death to do anything more to Putin as he marches into the Ukraine because he's threatened to shut off their, oil, their gas. Who cares? They don't need anything else. But it gets even worse because now we start saying, OK, well, here we go. We can provide them that gas. We can make it all possible. Seriously? We extract this particular and provide it over here. And our number of gas available is one tenth of what Russia holds. So we'll only take the gas out of our ground faster so that Europe can be independent of Russia to deplete our resources that much faster. And that's the real crisis that occurs because I am of the opinion that we will be doing this piece for a very long time yet. Moving to renewable tomorrow is just not possible because we, we need technology to, to be able to provide the footholds necessary to move to the next step. We need to have a serious conversation about how nuclear adds to that equation. But these are issues. Again, if you want to consider how critical this has become and why I believe this is even more of an issue, is right here. And it's amazing that none of this has been covered at all by any of the American press. And when Russia, Iran, and Venezuela are mentioned in the same paragraph as a reason for why production and oil prices are plummeting, we should be scared to death. And the reason being is three of those countries are controlled by despots, Russia, Iran, and Venezuela somewhat. Do you think that Putin cares or the prime minister of Iran cares if their population suffers through two to three years of downed oil prices? Although they'll tell you they will. Do you really think so? If they knew that they could win this war without firing a shot. Because the economic stability of the world is dependent on a stabilized oil price. They don't have to fire a shot. All the Soviet Union has to do is to say, turn on the spigot. Pump as much oil out of the ground as you possibly can, because the truth of the matter is we own more than everyone else. Between Saudi Arabia and Russia, they hold the greatest reserves on the face of the earth. So while we might be able to produce enough to provide, pro pro provide stability for ourselves, Russia will have far more capacity to go out into the future. And what's more important, if you understand that the stability of the oil means that the stability of our economic globe is at risk, read the Wall Street Journal article last, published last Monday, Six Winners, Six Losers. And they lay out who are the six winners and six losers. And some of those are countries that have been in an economic slump for the last 20 years, one being Japan. And the reason why Japan has been in an economic slump is because it hasn't been able to afford the price of oil. If, in fact, the price of oil continues to drop, and, and Japan, for example, 
begins an economic boom, becoming more and more dependent on that finite source, the four major oil producers have to do nothing more than turn off production. The price of oil will skyrocket and economies will crumble, never having fired a shot. That's how destabilizing this finite element, this one single resource, is on world security. And how quickly the tides can turn because we're not taking enough steps today to make absolutely certain that we are independent of that point going forward. It doesn't make any difference where or how. The finality of that is real. And it may not happen in a decade. It may not happen in two decades. But the truth of the matter is, solar's been around for nearly 60 years, and we're just starting to adopt. There's more solar energy per cubic foot in the southwest United States generated every day than can power a home for a month. We just have to figure out how to harness that energy. The solar industry in California employs more people today than all four of the IOUs combined. It's blossoming in California. IOUs are investor-owned investor -owned utilities. utilities. So the solar industry employs more people than does the IOUs. And what's really amazing is read the reports that came out just this past week, and the wind turbines that were basically taken to task in the Midwest are now credited with saving the Midwest ratepayers nearly a billion dollars in charges because the wind farms that were not in production during the last polar vortex are now in production. With a polar vortex comes wind. With wind comes energy. With energy comes a stabilized rate. And the energy companies of the Midwest did not have to resort to aviation fuel, which is more expensive, which caused the price of energy to, to spike in the last polar vortex. It's there. We just got to figure out how to harness it. So the capacity is there and we can make it all happen. There's more than enough on this end, geothermal. And again, I still think that while nuclear is not renewable, it needs to be part of the conversation. And we need to get away from the 1960s and 1970s technology conversations, the Three Mile Islands, the Chernobyls. Those are things of the past. The technology has long been advanced. The last nuclear power plant built in the United States was built in 1983 with 1960s and 1970s technology. And different from the Navy and the way we operate theirs, we update the power and utilities are regulated to maintain the existing requirements. So they're operating 40-year-old plants with 40-year-old safety standards and not allowed to upgrade to do anything else. They're just not built in the same fashion. So we have to, we have got to figure it out. Well, there's still a waste product every day. There still is a waste product. That's still but the waste, the waste also, we also have to have a conversation about how we handle the waste to include the fact that it's still a boiler. It is a boiler. It is not new technology. There was the, the zero point energy and vortex mathematics is not even mentioned at all in this group at all. I was surprised of it, the of the uh, lack of coverage on this topic. The, and I'm not, I'm not advocating that there are not technologies that are out there. There are tons of technologies. Well, we need is something like the Manhattan Project. We do to, need the Manhattan to, Project. To, to go these alternative energies, to go for the Tesla energies, to go for the uh, uh, Vortex Mathematics. That is a real phenomenon, by the way. And Randy Powell, yep. and with uh, um, uh, his teacher, I forgot his name. I'm a little nervous right now. But it is available, and it needs to be addressed. We have, we have lots of technologies. The difference is whether or not we formulate the opportunity for them to advance. Uh, if, you know, to be perfectly honest, given the keys to the castle? Right. Well, I, think, uh, I think what's going on is maybe who is in charge of all the money, which I suspect the oil companies. I would not have invested in they, solar tech. Yeah. And, they, and again, again they're, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to, um, you know, the, the solar is kind of the enemy to them too. So Absolutely. That's, that's what's going on. Yeah. But, but we, money. we as a nation built 
um, 41 hydroelectric plants and 7,000 miles of highway during the last depression and stimulus. How much did we take care of this time around? And we put our kids in debt, $17 trillion. $17 trillion is what we gave our kids. We have nothing to show for it. We disassembled the greatest scientific entity ever known to man and now call it a research laboratory. All of the brilliant minds in NASA now work for all the commercial entities in science across the globe. They no longer are predicated on doing what it is that got us to the moon. Right, well, it was, it was right. It's, it's, so it can yeah. be anything from the Tesla. Mm -hmm. I mean, John over here represents a, a purification system that should be in every single home. We can't get it through the regulatory process, which is, again, the purpose of this was not to introduce the technology. The purpose of this is to tell you that we have to have an adult conversation. We need to sit down with our legislators and regulators and force an adult conversation because they are not looking at the problem in this fashion. They are not looking to see whether or not those technologies can be introduced without pilot projecting everything. We're, Japan is just now, just now decommissioning their bullet train. I attended a conference not too long ago where people literally are talking about Let's pilot project a bullet train here in the United States. Are you kidding me? It's been operating in Japan for 30 years. What do you want a pilot project? It's, it works. So, so at what point in time, if, if it's not made in America, you can't use it? The toilets to taps, for example, have been used in 80 major cities across the globe. And people go, ooh. Hey, do you think submarines get all of their I mean, we've been purifying water forever and a day. It's possible. In the space shuttle. Jonathan's been jumping, jumping at the bit here. Good. Just Jonathan. about done. Okay, everybody. I had to say something because I'm actually a huge proponent of a nuclear thing, especially serving on carriers. One of my biggest issues, you know, in, in terms of awareness, so I'm going to make it very quick, two parts. One, to directly address your issue with the weight. To, to be more specific on what he said was, uh, the United States uses generation one and two reactors. France, Japan, Germany, Russia, they use generation three, four, and some, in some cases, generation five reactors. The waste from a generation one or two reactor gets put back into the system in a three, four, five reactor. So you're basically taking your, your, your energy cell, depleting it, and then putting it back in the system to reuse it again. Any amount of nuclear waste that you might think the U.S. has, if we built a three, four, or five generation reactor, all we would do is take that waste and put it back into the we, we, we take the fuel out of our commercial reactors based upon the 1960s protocol for uranium. And the reason why we built our reactors in that fashion was if you deplete the uranium any further, you get to weapons grade material. So we took it out of the reactor, and we put it away to make absolutely certain that nobody could ever hijack this stuff and use it for weapons. Well, guess what? Those days are long gone. The capacity of that uranium in that Type 1 still has 80% of its life left. As a matter of fact, we're going to be paying for the next five years for San Onofre in the decommissioning process because it's going to take five years for the reactor to stop producing the heat so they can handle the material. But yet, they can't use that heat to generate electricity. That would be too stupid. <laughs> My second part, very quickly, in 10 seconds is, just so we're clear, most of the, most of the quote unquote radioactive waste that we have in the United States, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's like 85% of it isn't ours. It's not ours. go get it from other countries. So it didn't become used for weapons grade. So most of the stuff that we have doesn't belong to us in the first place. Or it belongs to us now because we went and got it from somewhere. Yeah. It, we can use it for energy if we were. But we, but, but again, we've made decisions to bury it in the ground and fill the hole up with cement. So we can't even extract it if we wanted to. Rom? Short one, okay? Yeah. Rom, you have to speak up louder so people in the back can hear. Okay. In comments on batteries, I spent there's um, you can um, 
cobalt, and then go to uh, throw batteries. Throw batteries, 20,000 recharge cycles, Ron, people can't hear you. You have to speak very loud. Okay. Well, I'll Stand up and speak very loud. It, it, uh, and we evolved with energy storage. The batteries went from lead acid to uh, absorbed glass mat to lithium ion to cobalt and then to flow batteries. Flow batteries can provide 20,000 recharge cycles instead of 6,000 with lithium ion. And they cost about the same price. And also, there's no environmental impact with them. But the issue there is the efficiency. When you discharge the battery and recharge the battery, then that's where the losses are. Now, the issue is how do we minimize those losses? Right now, it's about 20 to 30 percent for as many companies out there, and it's been reduced down to 12 percent. But the issue is that there's 1.2 volt cells in the battery. We need four, 760 volts DC to give you 480 volts AC, for example, you can to a power line. So Wrong. Too detailed. You're losing everybody. You got to get. To, you got to get to a very specific point. Okay, Nobody's understanding you right now. <laughs> That's way too detailed. High voltage, in order to provide high voltage. Most of the battery companies up there do not know how to get enough DC voltage out of the battery. They're losing 20 to 30 percent of their power trying to get those batteries to a higher voltage. There's a few companies who know how to do it. That's how you can get 90 percent recovery instead of 70 percent recovery when you try to discharge right. battery. Other comment is that 35 ppm is the normal flow through the ocean in this area. Instead of going 70 to 100 ppm, when they take the salt from Poseidon and send it back into the ocean. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that's a, okay, a quick. Risk, but does Eric? Yeah, I've got a little bit of um, kind of an epiphany that I had. It was kind of some good news for that. Um, back in the um, 1990s, there was a project called SOPEC. SOPEC they started ocean fertilization. Fertilization experiment. They put a very small amount of iron in the ocean. It creates a huge algae bloom which sucks up CO2. People thought, well, let's go ahead and maybe we should just dump iron in the ocean. Would that be the way to do it? And what's the natural cycle? The wind blows off the Gobi Desert and dumps iron in the ocean. Is that how it happens? And then a couple months ago, I had an epiphany. And I'll tell you what happened. I found out about sperm whales. So sperm whales hunt and eat huge squid at the bottom of the ocean a couple of miles down. They come up, they defecate. And that's how they cycle iron in the ocean. So we killed 1.1 million sperm whales back when we hunted whales. We kind of think, oh, the whale hunting season is over. It was something that happened in the past. We're over it. Nah. It was a huge open wound. It's still in the ocean today. Those whales are all missing. Those whales were what kept the ocean fertile. The ocean, as you mentioned, is the biggest carbon sink on the planet. It's huge. If the ocean is fertile, it sucks all that CO2 back in again. We've got to put the whales back where they were. It's not save the whales. It's restore the whales. And, you, and there's something called the krill paradox. And this is it. You think, well, Great blue whales hunt krill. Well, the great blue whales were hunted from 330,000 down to less than 10,000 whales. Well, you think, well, now the krill should be really happy because all the whales are gone. It should be exploding the population. It's exactly the opposite. As the whales disappear, the krill also disappear. The whales make the, bio, the, the nutrients bioavailable for the krill to live on. So you think of like, you know, a beaver creates a little dam, a little tiny mammal, but it creates this huge biosphere that all these other animals live in. And that's the way the ocean works too. The whales are responsible for this huge biosphere which is missing. And so what we need to do is we really need to push the whale reproduction rate. It's at 4% now. It's going to take 90 years to get the whales back where they were if we stop hunting them right now. But we've got to move those shipping lanes, we've got to stop polluting the ocean, and we've got to make the whales back where they were because that was what kept the ocean. Did, and that goes right back to the first slide that I showed and said mankind and nature. We just simply don't understand and are not willing to address how to change our lives and our behaviors so that nature is allowed to do what it is that's necessary to preserve going forward. I mean, if you think about it, and you can, you can expand that to virtually anywhere. Um, go back and read the Yellowstone, Park, the Yellowstone Park Recovery Project and look what happens when the, when the wolf was introduced back into the Yellowstone I mean, we're even seeing characterizations of the, of the river that have totally changed because of the reintroduction of the wolf. The bee population of the United States has been virtually decimated because we've commercialized bee pollinization. So much so that we now prohibit in California any introduction of bees across the border. Reason being is the strain of bees in California are not in the same fashion as the Incas were subject to the Spaniards, 
The disease they bring from the Gulf Coast introduced a strain of disease that the California bee wasn't capable of handling and virtually decimated 60% of the California bee population. Huge crisis? You bet. There's probably about 40 or 50 uh, um, plants that only are propagated by the bee. The avocado is only propagated by the bee. So you can introduce all the flowers you want or whatever, but we don't understand just how damaging we have been to the environment and what it's gonna to take to turn that around. Um, and unfortunately, we've commercialized everything. Um, and that commercialization is again, it's, it's the critical element that we have to start that adult conversation. We, we have to move away from the quarterly return. We've, we've got to move into a more, what is, it, what is it gonna take to preserve this for 100 years? I'm real cognizant of time, and I know we're way over time right now for our speaker and my promise there. I, I did promise John one more. Um, if, you, if you can hold your questions maybe to a personal question afterwards, and if you can stay for a few minutes and sure. ask for them. John, you get the last question tonight, okay, and then we'll wrap up, okay? Great. Yep. source of really sustainable energy substitution. That's where the next management market, in my estimation, should come to play. I, again, I didn't introduce, because there's a myriad of technologies. The question is, is, is truly there a, a system to bring those technologies to the forefront? Because I would tell you that if you take a look at the introduction of the new technologies into the space that we currently have, oil and gas is paying virtually every penny they can to prevent the introduction and the chaos in the business model. Exactly. So again, this, this all goes back to the business model that our grandparents created for us got us here. The problem is, is that all the decisions that we're making are predicated on the fact that that business model needs to be maintained and protected. We've even created a regulatory process and in 1923 when we deregulated the energy industry and created power and utility commissions, by law created an opportunity for investor-owned utilities to have a 10% return on their investment, guaranteed, by law. There's not another business in the entire United States that by legislation is offered the opportunity for a guaranteed regulatory body to ensure a 10% investment on their investment, regardless of the results of that investment. Whether it's good or bad, they're guaranteed 10%. And they are not required to carry their deferred maintenance on their balance sheet. Because we turned over the, process, we turned over the grid to the IOUs and said, here, we had made a mess of it, you take it, you fix it, and you don't have to carry any of it on your balance sheet. The United States is in the worst shape it's ever been in its distribution grid capacity, so much so that Texas decided in 1956, when they took a look at what the grid was going to look like, created their own. So we have an East Coast, West Coast, and a Texas grid in this country. And you wonder why Texas has a 42% renewable success rate? It's because they don't have the grid problems that the rest of the country has. And the, and the maintenance, deferred maintenance, from the IOUs or, or from the energy industry on itself is not carried on their balance sheet. But yet for the past 36 years, they have provided a quarterly dividend to their shareholder on a consistent basis. But, th this has, but see, this is exactly the process when I say we have to have a different conversation. If we were to conserve, let's just go to water. It doesn't make any difference. The utility structure and the business model that we have created is not sustainable. If San Diego County were to save 13% of its water consumption from today, the San Diego Water District would cease to exist because there's insufficient dollar flow to keep the utility operating. And we have done a tremendous job. As a matter of fact, San Diego reduced its water consumption from 1991 by 21% and had an 8% growth rate. But yet if we reduced an additional 13%, there would be insufficient revenues generated by that to keep the utility solvent. It's a, it's a crisis.
but it's a crisis in the business model, not a crisis in, yeah. We've had one of San Diego's best and brightest here tonight. Would you help me acknowledge him? Thank you. Yeah, quite a bit longer. Thank, thank you very much. It's been very an honor welcome. having